Now, in case you missed it, we are in the midst of a health crisis. And here are some statistics, I'm not going to dwell on too long, of the awful truth. 70% of our country is overweight, 36% are obese. We have 10 million people, 10 million, who are morbidly obese. We have 24 million people at least with diabetes, and a quarter of them do not know it. In a generation, it is estimated that 86% of people will be either overweight, 51% obese. This is costing us $270 billion a year annually. And locally, a recent study showed that in Beaufort County, 43% of fifth graders were either obese or at serious risk of becoming so, and in Jasper County, this county, 58% of eighth graders were already obese or at serious risk of becoming so. Friends, we have to look into our hearts and find the will to change this situation. Because if we look into the hearts of our children, we will already find in some of them, as young as three years of age, the early signs of heart disease. In the movie Apollo 13, Commander Lovell, played by Tom Hanks, says, people say it was a miracle going to the moon. It wasn't a miracle. We just decided to do it. Well, you have to say that with a few exceptions, as far as obesity is concerned, we haven't decided to do it. In fact, you could argue the opposite. For example, in the fashion industry, what once was a size 14 is now a more acceptable and politically correct size 10. So what are we going to do about this in our efforts to change this crisis? Well, I'm going to look at neuroscience um, because neuroscience is the way that individuals and, co and collectively we can change our behavior. When I was in psychotherapy training back in the last millennium, it was all about your mother. Now it's all about your mother's neurotransmitters. Well, that's a slight exaggeration, of course, but we can learn from neuroscience. The first thing we need to know from neuroscience is that we are not logical people. We are psychological, often with the emphasis on the psycho. <laughs> we are emotional beings with the ability to rationalize. And yet we continue to do programs that appeal to logic and rationality, which are low down on the list of motivators. So just giving information about nutrition alone isn't going to change people. That's like treating drug addicts by giving them the chemical structure of drugs. Awareness is helpful. It is a precursor for change but it isn't change itself. It's the pre-game show, but it's not the game. So how do we change? How do we change? What do we have to do? We have to engage people at an emotional and an experiential level. Our brains, our primitive brains, really run the show, and we hope that periodically, more often than not, our newer brains, our prefrontal lobes, our frontal cortex, will exert some civilizing influence. So it's about information, and uh, it's not about information, it's about emotion, and it's about experience. Now there's a cheeseburger. Man, is that a cheeseburger? That's the biggest cheeseburger I've ever seen. Um, but let's imagine that that is your typical cheeseburger and it's 550 calories. You want some fries with that? Yes, that's another 600. Do you want a uh, drink? Yeah, I'll have a shake. Uh, 16 ounces, that's 600 calories. So let's, what happens if we change the information and try to make it more impactful? I have discovered 
um, that there is a direct neural pathway from the emotional limbic areas of your brain right into your wallet. So if we change these into a cent a calorie, let's call these Rankin dollars, and say, let's look at these foods in terms of a cent a calorie. A cheeseburger is 550. The fries are six bucks. The shakes, six bucks. At meal, 1,750 calories or $17.50. Okay. So how many people, knowing that there are 1,750 calories in that meal, are really going to change their behavior? Yeah, a few perhaps. How many people would change their behavior if they actually had to pay $17.50 for that meal? Let's look at something else. Let's look at calorie expenditure. Let's say the average person, about 180 pounds, burns about 100 calories a minute. If you're a little less than that, we're being generous to you. So you want to burn off the calories in that cheeseburger, you've got to walk five and a half miles. The fries, you've got to walk six. The milkshake, another six. So you have to walk 17 and a half miles if you want to burn off that food. Now, how many people knowing the fact that you have to walk 17 and a half miles actually would change their behavior? Yeah, a few perhaps. But how many would change their behavior if they had to actually walk the 17 and a half miles? There is a difference between just giving information and creating an experience and an emotion for people. That's how people change. So your brain is not your consciousness. Your brain is not your consciousness. Okay? You like to think that it is, but it isn't. So just because you wake up one morning and decide, today is the day, that you are going to quit smoking, stop drinking, change your eating habits. The big question is, why should your brain listen to you? Okay? You have trained it. It's not going to be that easy just because you've decided. In fact, in many ways, even though we experience our actions, we think we have conscious control of them, and sometimes we really don't. It's not just about telling people. It's about engaging them as we've seen um, by uh, Kelly earlier today, how you have to engage people. It's not just information. Now, I happen to believe that you can't exercise much conscious control of your behavior if you don't have a balanced brain. Balance is something that we look for in all aspects of our life. It's elusive. St. Augustine said, Total abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. He was talking about sex, of course, but he's right, okay? He's right. So you can't talk people out of a balanced, uh, if they have an unbalanced brain. You can't talk them out of an unbalanced brain. If you go up to a friend of yours who's depressed and you say to him, oh, come on, cheer up. You know, like, look at all your blessings. Life could be, you know, you know, life could be a whole lot worse. Is that going to change them? No, it's going to make them worse because they can't feel better. And you better watch out because if they can muster the effort, they might smack you in the mouth. Right? <laughs> you can't talk people out of an unbalanced brain. Information is not enough. So how do you change a balanced brain? Well, you can change a balanced brain a number of ways. One is, is through medication, and another is through specific brain training. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about brain mapping. We have the capability of actually looking at how balanced a brain somebody has. And when we do brain mapping, we look at the neurological activity in the brain. We look at the measures of magnitude, how much activity is going on, measures of dominant frequency and connectivity. Um, and this enables us to look at the ratios between different brain waves. This is technical stuff, but what I'm saying is it's very easy to look at the brain and see how well balanced it is. Here is an example of a balanced brain. If you actually look uh, at this legend here, you see that this is the measure of activity at different sites of the brain. If you look here, you can see yellow is very high, red is high, green is okay compared to a normative database of your peers, blue is low, and dark blue is very low. If you look at this brain map, you see, by and large, this person's brain is pretty balanced. It falls within uh, the normative limit limits. 
You look at this map and you say, oops, there's a little problem here, okay? You see there's very high areas over here in this alpha section and in this delta section. In fact, this is a brain map of an eight-year-old child with ADD. We can see that this uh, area of the brain is very highly active, and when you look at the ratio between alpha and beta, it is a very, very reliable way of measuring attention deficit disorder. So we actually have objective measures at looking at how balanced a brain is and how you do something about that. Now, so there's medication and there's brain training, and brain training looks at, uh, uses neurofeedback to actually change the brain. So for example, uh, right here on the left-hand side, you see here's a, a brain, an alpha brain, with somebody's activity, and you can see that it's pretty low. And there, after we've done some neurofeedback, which is brain biofeedback using some simple principles, you can see that the activity on the right side has changed. So we are able to change people's brains using not just medication, but also um, neurofeedback and biofeedback training. Um, here's another example looking at beta activity in the brain. Beta activity in the brain is associated with information processing. And again, you can see over here, uh, it was, here it's pretty low. After some neurofeedback training, it becomes more balanced than normal. So a balanced brain becomes very important if we want people to take information, take advice, and actually be able to act on it. Now, there are other things that change the balanced brain. And those are key lifestyle behaviors. And you know what I'm going to talk about, right? When I talk about key lifestyle um, behaviors, one is, of course, exercise. Exercise is the single biggest thing you can do to balance your brain. Exercise is the single biggest thing you can do to balance your brain. Any client who comes to me in my general clinical psychology practice, I don't care how old they are or what they're coming complaining of, I want to put them on an exercise regimen. Because unless their brain is balanced, it doesn't matter how clever I am and how much brilliant advice I've got, it's not going to be mu make much of a difference. It's going to be all words. Exercise is the single biggest thing you can do to balance your brain. Next one, stress management. When we have stress management, our brain is on information overload. We live in an overstimulated world. And we need to be able to relax that brain and get out of information processing into what's called relaxed wakefulness. So you know the sorts of things you need to do. Yoga, meditation, prayer. It is really important. We live in an overstimulated world. And we do not uh, balance our brains. A lot of us feel as if we're not in information processing mode. We're not being effective. We're being unproductive. We feel guilty. A balanced brain is not information processing frenzy. And that's what we live in right now. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at how the brain requires energy, and in information processing, we require a lot of energy. Your brain is 2% of your body and needs 25% of the energy uh, that your body has. And there are two ways your brain can get energy. One is it can go into your body and draw it yourself, or it can go straight to the food source. Now, you can see what will happen if you go straight to the food source. And we have trained ourselves to do that. Obviously, sensible nutrition is important. Your brain's energy is about nutrition. And your nutrition will feed your brain either appropriately or inappropriately and will give it energy or deprive it of energy with all the consequences that happen. The fourth thing is sleep. Poor sleep leads to poor energy, leads to lethargy, less exercise, lower mood, poor concentration, poor cognitive function. Poor sleep is severely underestimated. So, those are ways we balance our brain. And here at Mindstream, the things that we do for our students are exactly that. We do use brain mapping and neurofeedback to help balance their brain. We do treat, show them and, and give them the healthy lifestyle behaviors. And we do do very specific behavioral training on health skills. You can do that. 
You know, you can't tell people to have self-control, but you sure as heck can train it. So there are ways of training people so they are more receptive and training our teens. Now, the brain is also a social brain. What we see other people doing is a huge influence on our behavior. It's what we call social proof. No man is an island. And those who want to be are more Alcatraz than Hilton Head. Okay? <laughs> we like to think of ourselves as rugged individualists, but in fact, we are programmed to be copycats. And we just saw in that video about how to start a movement. So what we see going on around us is a huge influence on us. So we have to change the culture. We have a culture where 70% of people are overweight and we live in a fat culture. We have to change that. If we don't change it, this is like a massive, morbidly obese snowball going down a very steep and long hill. We really need to change, not just the culture, but we need to train our youth because youth are the best opportunity we have for changing this and they uh, deserve it. We owe it to them to change. But we're not doing it. Tennessee Williams in A Cat on a Hot Turn Roof really exposed denial really well where one character says to another, when some, who's hiding a secret, when something is festering in your memory or imagination, the laws of silence don't work. That's like locking a house that's on fire and pretending it's not burning. Not facing a fire doesn't put it out. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for all of us to face the fire and put it out before it affects not just this generation, but every successive one. Thank you so much.